Great. Hi. Hello, brother. H hey, little brother. <laughs> um, so uh, let's start talking about Last Days of Night. Yeah. And uh, maybe why don't we start with how did you get the idea for this book? Um, why did you think this was a story worth telling? Um, you know, it actually came uh, when I was, on a, I was on a book tour for my first book. First book came out at the end of 2010, and I was on this book tour, and it's a long story, but you end up um, on these long road trips. I was on this long road trip from Chicago to New York, and if you ever drive from Chicago to New York, what you find is there's this thing in the middle that they call Pennsylvania, um, and it long. it's real long. It never stops. It's like this endless expanse of Pennsylvania. I was on this trip with some friends, and there had been this big question of sort of what my next book should be about. Like, I found myself in this moment where I'd had a book come out. I was suddenly kind of, I was a novelist. I was a professional writer for the first time in my life, which meant that I was someone who was supposed to have ideas professionally. Like, suddenly in my life, I was someone who was supposed to have ideas for a living. And there was a lot of pressure around that. Like, what does that mean? What does it mean to sort of come up with ideas on command and be able to you know, turn that into a profession? And so I kept sort of thinking about trying to conceptualize this for myself and um, what it meant for me personally. And then I was on this road trip. It's the middle of the night. And as you, my brother, well know, uh, when I'm kind of sleepy at the wheel on a long road trip and I just want to stay awake, I just start chattering. Uh, just this endless chattering, and we're driving past this Westinghouse uh, company manufacturing plant, and I'm just sitting there chattering away, oh, and George Westinghouse, that's funny. You never hear about George Westinghouse. Like, no one ever talks about him. And my friends in the car say, well, um, what was the, why don't you ever hear about George Westinghouse? And I say, you know, I don't know. I remember he had some sort of rivalry with Thomas Edison and something about Nikola Tesla, but um, they all sort of hated each other. They were all working on the light bulb, but separately, and um, uh, it seemed like they all had this great rivalry surrounding this, this big idea they thought they each had. Um, and my friend just said, well, well, what if your next book was about that? Uh, and it was this moment where I realized that Thomas Edison, George Westinghouse, and Nikola Tesla were each people who had ideas professionally, and they had much better ideas than I did. <laughs> so if I could look to them both as models of how to think about a process of invention as well as a subject for my next book, it would kind of be two, two birds with one stone. You realize you just opened the door for everyone to tell you what your next book or movie should be about. <laughs> um, so let, let's set the stage for this. Um, maybe tell us a little bit about the state of uh, electricity at that time um, and where, uh, who, are, who are the major players in this, in this rivalry. Yeah, so uh, we're, in, we're in New York in the late 1880s, um, and it was, it was an interesting time. I mean, so indoor electrical light had been this holy grail of electrical science for 100 years at that point. Um, and it, the technology was interesting because everyone sort of hoped it was possible. People have been using electricity for stuff for, for almost 100 years. Um, but no, it wasn't ubiquitous. No one was quite sure kind of what to do with it. There were outdoor electrical lights, but they were kind of unruly. And the idea of indoor electrical lights was something that everyone knew that if someone could get this to work, it would be, if not the most valuable invention in human history, one of them. Um, but no one could get it to work. Um, and there were all these questions about why. Lots of academics said it was impossible. Um, they had these ideas that it violated various rules of physics that turn out not to be true. Um, and Edison was the first person, after all this time, and what he really did is he had already become quite, um, quite wealthy uh, on his other inventions, from his other inventions, and he kind of, Edison built the first real R&D lab. Um, he was the one who hired 100 a, a engineers and stuck them in this lab in Menlo Park in New Jersey and would kind of give them these commands. And so what his great genius was is he was the one to, to look at the problem of indoor electrical light, which, again, for 100 years people have been working on. And he said, you know, looking at where all the technology is right now, I think we're about two years away. So uh, you 100 guys don't leave this room uh, until it works. You have all the resources you want. It should take about two years. And he was kind of right. First product manager in history. 
I mean, he really was. And that's the skill to say we're two years away and to be relatively accurate about that prediction after 100 years was, was pretty miraculous. Um, but then, of course, there were, there were problems with the technology was, he was putting out. And I think this is where Westinghouse got involved 10 years later, kind of looking at the early bulbs that Edison was putting out and saying, you know, uh, yeah, he kind of got this to work, but these are really bad. Like, they don't work that well, and they're really expensive, and they break all the time, and they're smelly, and this is just sort of low-quality engineering. My team can do better. Like, Edison doesn't care about quality. He only cares about kind of being first and having all this pizzazz, and Edison was such a showman about it. Um, so what Westinghouse did was this much more humble kind of strategy where he just started buying up patents. He bought some French patents and some British patents and started assembling them together into uh, something he could build as a light bulb. Um, and for me, as I started thinking about these guys, you know, what was interesting was that they represented Edison, Westinghouse, and then Nikola Tesla, who we can talk about, represented these three mutually incompatible visions of what it meant to invent something. Um, if uh, Edison was kind of the great, the great showman, the great salesman, mm -hmm. he was all about the audience and kind of letting people know that light bulbs were safe, you can put them in your homes. Um, he communicated really well with the press. Um, he was kind of one of the most famous men in America at the time. Um, Westinghouse sort of like lived quietly in the countryside near Pittsburgh, didn't do a lot of interviews, um, but he was a craftsman. For him, it was all about building the best light bulbs. It was about like, I just want to make the best product. I don't care if it's a little too expensive. I don't care if it takes 10 years longer to make it to market than Edison's. It's going to be the best, and it's going to be the best light bulb in the world. Uh, and then, of course, we come to Tesla, who's kind of the there's a lot of myth-making surrounding Nikola Tesla as a figure. Um, and some of it, I think, is true. Some of it, I think, is not. Um, but he, he was an interesting guy. He worked for Edison. Well, he was Serbian, um, was in Paris for a while, came to New York. He had this sort of um, classic like, immigrant story where he moves to New York, marches into Thomas Edison's office, demands a job, kind of talks his way into getting one, worked for Edison for a while before getting fired. Um, was on his own and doing all this really pioneering work on alternating current as opposed to the direct current that everyone else was using. Um, no one would work with him. He was not good in a professional uh, laboratory setting. And so uh, he was someone who ended up creating a lot of the technology that these various systems were based on. He then tried partnering with Westinghouse for a while. That didn't work. Westinghouse fired him after less than six months. Um, and so I always thought this, there was this great kind of triptych of characters, like Edison, the salesman, Westinghouse, the craftsman, and Tesla, the idea man, this guy who only cares about um, the idea themselves. All he wants to do is kind of create these, have these wonderful ideas for technology, and then not see them through. And right. I think that's he, something. He almost didn't care about what ended up happening, what got made. Once it was solved from a scientific point of view, he was, he was happy. Yeah, and I think that's, um, I think that's exactly right. Um, and that's what makes him, in some ways, sort of a tragic figure. Um, and it's funny that he's become kind of this like, pop culture icon now. Yeah. Um, because if you were to uh, ask for a list of all of Nikola Tesla's kind of greatest inventions, that list would have zero items on it. He didn't actually do anything, um, but he had great ideas. Um, he never, not a single one of those ideas was actualized into a product that he built, because he just didn't care. And there is something kind of beautifully poetic about that. Um, I don't know. In my mind, I always think Westinghouse gets the short end of the stick. Like, right, I like the guy who actually builds the thing. You're a Westinghouse fan. Yeah. Why is that? Um, Westinghouse is so like the least sexy of all these names, right? You, Thomas Edison was super famous. Tesla became this cult hero. Um, I think he, because he got so screwed financially on yeah. all these all these arrangements by Edison and Westinghouse. Um, but Westinghouse is the guy who very quietly, like the electrical system that we know and enjoy today, was built by George Westinghouse. It was he was the one who was able to take Tesla's unruly ideas about alternating current and turn them into something you could actually sell to people that worked really well. 
Um, he was able to kind of negotiate the legal stuff with Edison. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what my book's about. That's what Last Days is about. It's about the legal battle between them. Right. And so the book actually centers around Paul Cravath, who would later go on to, to start Cravath, Swain, and Moore, which is a really large law firm. Uh, why center around the lawyer of all people? Yeah, so that was the sort of big idea when I started the book. Um, it was saying, I knew I wanted to write something about the relationship between Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla. Um, these kind of, as I said, three pillars of three guys with mutually incompatible ideas of what it means to invent something, what it means to make something. And as such, they hated each other. Um, so I kept going through, early on in my process, um, I kept thinking, OK, well, well so who's, whose story am I telling? Am I telling Edison's story, Westinghouse's story, Tesla's story? Whose perspective do I want to see this from? And I kept finding that if I told it from any of their perspectives specifically, it would, it would kind of tip my hand. I'd be picking sides. Right. And then I was digging through this Edison biography, um, and I found one spare sentence about him having a meeting with Westinghouse's head lawyer, Paul Cravath. And I thought to myself, oh, is that, is that the same Paul Cravath who founds the largest, most prestigious law firm in the world, Cravath, Swain, and Moore? Um, I looked it up. It turned out it was. Uh, no one had ever written a book about Paul Cravath before, um, which is always as someone who does historical work, um, when you find a subject that no one has written about at all before, that means one of two things. Uh, that means either you've, you've found this like hidden gold pile in the dirt somewhere, or else it is the most boring story possible. And there is a reason no one has written about it before, because there's just no story there at all. Um, but as I started digging, I found that it seemed like there was a really fascinating story um, about Paul Cravath, who at the time, uh, Paul was 26 years old. He's um, the son of a preacher and the grandson of a preacher from, uh, from Nashville. Um, he'd moved to New York uh, with no money, graduated first in his class from Columbia Law School, and he'd been a practicing attorney for less than 18 months at uh, this three-person firm when he signed his first client. George Westinghouse, who at that time had just been sued by Thomas Edison for patent infringement over the light bulb. And this was a lawsuit that um, Edison's team conservatively estimated the value of the patent suit at a billion dollars in 1888, um, which meant that it was the sort of thing worth going to court over. Um, and, and so this is real. So Westinghouse hires as his lead litigator on what I would argue is the largest patent suit in history. This 26-year-old who's never tried a case before. So based on your research, how do you think Westinghouse had the conviction to bet on this guy? I and mean, this is a room full of people who are routinely looking for people who are underrated talent that they bet on. <laughs> uh, he found one. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the question that the book is about. Like, why, The short answer is we historically we'll never know, right? We'll never know what exactly went on in that room when he picked this kid. Um, I think one of the answers is that he wanted someone unconnected to Edison. Edison was being financed by J.P. Morgan personally. Um, Edison had kind of limitless coffers, impeccably well connected around New York. Westinghouse was kind of like off in the prairie in Pennsylvania. Um, and I think he also, I think he wanted someone who would fight. And I'm not mm -hmm. sure that any, if he'd hired a bigger firm, a more prestigious firm, I'm not sure. They all would have tried to figure out some way out of it. No one wanted to go against Thomas Edison. No one wanted to go against J.P. Morgan. I mean, this was this insane. Right, and so, which leads to some of the tactics you, you used in this rivalry. Uh, Edison leaned on Morgan, who also owned a lot of the press at the time. Um, what, what are a couple, I think, you know, anecdotes of the, the actual battle? And some of the tactics are actually sort of frightful um, that Edison in particular used. Oh, yeah, they were pretty. <laughs> Fighting over electricity at the turn of the century was pretty rough. Um, I mean, so it was this legal battle happening, and one of the big questions when, when it ends up kind of turning into this uh, standards war, the first standards war, um, where Edison and his people are using direct current, Westinghouse, Tesla, and their folks are using alternating current, it became this big thing in the press about trying to um, kind of frame the, uh, frame the other person's current as being more dangerous. Right. Um, so Edison's first move was saying, uh, this AC is, Westinghouse's AC is new, it's untested, it's 
Um, it runs at higher voltages, so it must be more dangerous, which sounds intuitively true, but it's not. Um, but it, it was hard. It's, it's hard to explain electrical engineering to the public now, much less in 1890, when people are looking at this stuff and it looks to them like magic. Um, I mean, this is an anecdote, but one of the things, one of the things that I was most taken by in reading about the period was if you read the diaries of people who lived in in America in the early 1890s, people's descriptions of first seeing an electric indoor light bulb they described it as if they were seeing a new color. Like it was something that not only had they never seen before, but they could not imagine, they never even imagined anything like that before. It was so shocking to them. And not only did it change the way they looked at the physical space around them, but it changed the way they look at themselves. I mean, you have these people talking about looking at their own skin for the first time under an incandescent light bulb, and it's, they're having these moments of, oh my god, is that what my veins look like? Is that what my skin looks like? Um, it, was, it was this utterly shocking transformational thing. Um, so it was, very, it was very poorly known. No one really knew how it worked, and it seemed terribly magical. So um, Edison, Edison secretly, he wanted, um, he wanted people to, to think Westinghouse's current was dangerous. So one of the things he did was secretly paid this guy, Harold Brown, who was this kind of failed engineer, um, to go around staging these public demonstrations of the dangers of alternating current. He did so by electrocuting dogs. Um, and so they'd have these things where Brown pretended not to be related to Edison. Um, he pretended to be like an independent watchdog who would just sort of travel around showing people that alternating current had to be banned um, because it was dangerous. So he, Edison um, lived in New Jersey, and he paid the he, there's this crazy story about Edison paid the local, um, these kids in the neighborhood 25 cents a dog to bring him strays. And then Edison's team would take all the dogs, bring them to Brown for this traveling road show, and Brown would just start electrocuting these dogs in front of the public with Westinghouse's current. Um, Fierce. Yes, so it would seem dangerous. Um, and, then, and then Westinghouse, of course, was not good at dealing with the press. So Westinghouse would try and like, do these interviews where he would try and explain the science to people of, OK, well, higher voltages actually doesn't mean it's more dangerous. And blah, blah, blah. as many people in this room know, it's really hard to explain really new, hard science to an audience. But the sight of a dog being burnt alive resonates. Sticks with you. Yeah. Um, so where did the battle end up, the, the short version of, of who won? So this is something that I think is really, I mean, this is Paul Cravath's great genius, which is, um, uh, Edison wins the lawsuit. It goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And Edison wins the lawsuit, but Westinghouse wins the war. As I said before, our electrical system was built by George Westinghouse um, because what they had figured out was by the time they didn't need to win the lawsuit. They just needed to keep it going until the patent expired. Um, and, and there was this like genuine, you know, I think, philosophical debate about whether Edison's patent should apply. I mean, Edison's people were essentially saying, we invented the light bulb. All light bulbs are ours. And Westinghouse's people are saying, you invented a light bulb. Um, you did not invent the entire concept of light bulbs. Um, but it makes it to the Supreme Court, and what Paul realizes is they're going to lose, and they do. But before they lose, um, it's very complicated. But they are basically able to stage a coup within the Edison General Electric Company. Um, they get Edison Morgan, their financier, fires Edison from the company that Edison founded, EGE. They bring in this other guy to run it. They end up making this licensing deal with Westinghouse. Um, at the behest of the new guy who takes over, Edison's name is taken off the company. And so Edison General Electric becomes General Electric. Um, and Everyone lives happily after, except for Edison, who goes back. Um, and Tesla. And Tesla, who uh, we sort of skipped the Tesla part, uh, but who dies penniless and alone. Um, Edison does not. Edison is well paid for his time. Right. But is, I mean, he really, Edison, in his diary, Edison describes his name being taken off the company he founded as the worst event of his life. 
Um, that Edison said this only a couple years after his wife had died shows you something about Edison's priorities. Yeah. Um, so you, you also um, spent time studying another great inventor, uh, Alan Turing. And um, what do you think about uh, his, his style of invention uh, versus uh, the three, these three guys? Yeah. Um, so I wrote this film about Alan Turing, um, who was another, he was another interesting test case of kind of what it means to, to create things. Um, I feel so lucky that I get to take these examples, I get to use these examples of these kind of great thinkers um, for how to invent things. They've all obviously thought of things much smarter than anything I'm going to think of. Um, and it's great to be able to use them as a model of kind of how did they do it. I think, um, so Turing's, Turing's a funny example. Like if you look at, so if, if Edison's the salesman, Westinghouse is the craftsman, and Tesla is the idea man, um, Turing is some, I think everyone ends up being somewhere in between, right? I think about this all the time in my work. Um, I would suggest that to make things great, you need to have some element of all three mm -hmm. to, to do anything wonderful. Um, you need to be able to harness all three ideas. I think the light bulb only happens because all three of them were working on it. Um, I think Turing is, he, he was not a great salesman uh, historically. He was an academic, um, but I think he had to learn to become one. Um, and that's, when I wrote about Turing, we were concerned a lot with his, his work on cryptography during the Second World War. And that was a process where Turing came from, he had been an idea man, right? He'd been off at, at university just kind of writing these papers that were kind of well-known at the time, not necessarily that well-known outside of mathematics circles. And now he's in a military environment. A war is on. All these mathematicians are gathered together. They have to work together to solve these cryptographic problems, which means that for the first time in his life, he can't just have ideas. He actually needs to build some devices and uh, work with other people to do so. And those other people may not want to build them the same way he does. And so he needs to sell his version of these devices to them. And I think that's a skill he ended up learning during the war and then bringing to his work after the war. Because he sort of slightly becomes a public intellectual a little bit after the war. He does these, um, he starts doing these, these talks about, actually about the dangers of AI um, in 1947. Uh, so he was a little early. He has, his predictions were off slightly um, about when I, AI was going to become dangerous. Well, he was so prolific. I feel like one of the challenges in your script was that th there's so much of his career that you couldn't possibly include at all. He, he was a, a botanist as well, is that right? He was a really accomplished botanist. Um, he, this was something that he only proved recently. He came up with this algorithm for showing how um, uh, how leopards get their, their stripes. Um, like the way stripes work on the sides of animals. Like he figures out these, his range of interests is so broad. Um, it was really a stunning thing. And, and in some ways it was because he was, I always thought, like a bit of an outsider to all the fields that he joined. Um, like he was famously the guy at Cambridge who, like he was, he was an outcast within the Cambridge Mathematics Department, um, which was a hard place to be an outcast. So, um, right. Yeah. Um, which I think goes to why why you felt this was an important story to be told. And then I'd like to one thing that Graham and I love doing is is talking about um, the process of creating companies and and creating uh, creative projects or movies uh, in LA and, and how different yet yet similar they are. So why did you think um, the touring movie was so important to make? And then maybe a little bit about what was that process like? So it was very, very long. I refer to you sometimes as you know, an, a typical overnight success in the sense that it was 10 years in the making. <laughs> yeah, I think, that, I think that's accurate. Um, so, so that was a story where when we kind of found, when we first heard about it, I, I'd known the story since I was a kid. I mean, since we were growing up together in Chicago, I'd always been captivated by the Turing story. story. I think Turing, like, like Nikola Tesla, had kind of been this uh, kind of a legend uh, in computer science, this kind of the great myth of Alan Turing. And I'd always kind of thought it was this really beautiful, evocative story, um, and this very tragic life that ended far too soon. And so it always amazed me that no one had ever made a film of it. It had been told wonderfully on the page. There were some great biographies, some great novels. There was a wonderful play um, in the 80s. 
Uh, but it always seemed like, well, if this was a story, if any story w was kind of naturally cinematic and meant to be told on screen, this is the one. And that's something I think about a lot in, in what I do. It's like, what are finding stories that can ideally live in a particular medium? I'm lucky enough to be able to jump between uh, books and film and television. And so, so that was a story from the very beginning that was, OK, we want to make, we want to tell this Turing story, and we want to tell this Turing story on screen. Like, this is a film. A film is the version of the story that hasn't been told before. Let's do that. Let's make the most cinematic telling of the, the Alan Turing story. Um, at the time, I'd never written a film. I'd never worked in film. Uh, it was, except for Pirates vs. Ninjas. <laughs> except for Pirates vs. Ninjas. I had to tease, I my brother. Uh, so yeah, it was, um, so, so then it became this you know, five-year process of uh, the producers I was working with were young producers. They, um, they'd never made a movie before. They were working as assistants when I met them at a cocktail party. And we all just, we loved the story. And um, we kind of just started working on it and sort of said, OK, we're going to do this. And I'm going to write the script. And we'll figure it out. Great. Um, I want to make sure we have time for one, uh, one or two questions um, while we're uh, waiting for someone to, to raise their hand and grab the mic. I think one thing I'll say is that um, I think Graham is a, a good example of it. I think when people talk about um, you know, building creative projects, writing scripts, they, assume, they tend to overemphasize uh, talent and underemphasize work ethic. Um, <laughs> and uh, you, know, you used to always say, like, I, I, just, I need to write words. And you, just, you sit and you write words. And back in your little apartment in New York, you sit, like, dress up for work and sit at your little table in this like, tiny room and just write. Um, and so I, I like telling that story about you. Um, why don't we open up and see if anyone has uh, questions for Graham? I, yeah. I, I have an observation. It's a common, uh, first, it's a wonderful book. Only fiction book I've read in last de more than a decade. It was recommended to me by Steve Quake at Stanford to, to, that I sh have to read it. Um, there's backstabbing in it, fires, surreptitious <laughs> fires, romance, patent battles, IP theft, uh, actually raids on labs to steal stuff. Uh, wonderful intrigue, almost everything that goes on today. That's why, <laughs> uh, that's why it's relevant. But probably later when Steve Stout speaks, you'll see the importance of storytelling. One was trying to explain the science and the other guy was electrocuting dogs in public. Uh, this horrendous, shocking, very visible thing. And uh, more than 100 years later, we live with the consequences of storytelling versus science, uh, whether it was the right battle or the wrong battle. And I see it again in Tesla, today's Tesla, Elon Musk storytelling, while others are trying to do uh, spe feature specs on electric cars versus diesel cars or, uh, uh, or combustion cars and determine what we live with 50 or 100 years later. Uh, it just, that was my takeaway. I don't know if you have any additional comments on that. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I think that one of the things that I love writing this story and researching it was seeing how similar the debates and rivalries between Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla seemed to the debates among folks today. It's the same arguments they're having, the same fights surrounding IP, um, but also the same fights surrounding who's, who's going to move into a new field, whose company is going to succeed in something new. And I think you know, what Edison did such a great job of, and we can see people like him today, is saying, is bringing a product to a public that doesn't understand it and finding ways of, of explaining it to them with, with, you know, with electricity, with indoor electric light. We were talking about this with, with electricity. They knew that the light bulb was the killer app of electricity, right? Like, electricity was going to be really valuable. The, the real fight was not about who's making these light bulbs. The real fight is who is going to wire all of these homes across America with electricity. The only problem was that there were no devices that worked on electricity, except the light bulb. That was the first one, and it was the first. There were sewing machines, but honestly, electric sewing machines don't work that much better than manual sewing machines. So 
it, w it became this thing of like, okay, who's going to be able to explain to the public why it's safe to put a light bulb in their house, why it's not going to explode and burn everyone alive. Um, and that Edison was able to narrativize that and say, look, it's safe. And then also the other guy's thing is dangerous, but our thing is safe, um, which, yeah, is how he won. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks, Graham. Thank you.